welcome everyone to today's live show. I am Chelsea and I'm of course joined with the very special Dr. Robin Thompson. And in today's video, you are going to watch us discuss five common reasons women experience breastfeeding complications. I suppose we could say, Dr. Robin, birth and breastfeeding complications. And of course you have the unique perspective and understanding because this is the basis of your PhD, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. So we are very, very excited to share these five common um, complications and reasons with you so that hopefully you can make informed decisions and hopefully learn more and um, this, let this be the basis of your journey as you embark on this very new transition in your life. How exciting. So if you are pregnant, let us know. When are you due? We love hearing from you guys. Connect with us. Um, share your experiences as well as we go through these five common reasons. So number one, Dr. Robin, is understanding the power of preparation during pregnancy. I mean, we have so much to say on this topic, don't we? Yeah. Um, where do I start? Well, I start way back, <laughs> right in early pregnancy. Uh, preferably even, you know, if you're interested, looking at things earlier, but certainly in pregnancy, and especially first time pregnancy, because once you've had a baby, you have that little bit of experience, or a lot of experience, not a little bit, you have more experience and knowledge over that time. But certainly first time pregnancy is very important to gather as much information that you can so that you can be encouraged to be strong about what your needs are and how you are treated because the systems at the moment are controlling women and their time, Labor's uh, labor labor and birth is timed in a set to set times. Gestation is is a, a set gestation almost now. It's gone from what was used to be 38 to 42 weeks, then the averaged at 40, and now there's a lot of intervention at 39 weeks sometimes before. So, and, and there's just a, a paper, I haven't read it in detail, but a paper come out about um, the increase in interventions in private hospitals with private obstetricians. So I think, you know, there's a lot of things for a woman to consider when she's pregnant so that she's uh, not at the last minute trying to deal with the things that may occur along the way, that she's in control, that she's strong and that her, her, her advocates, the people around her, her partner are strong with her that's and you know we haven't we don't do the prenatal preparation like we did you know years ago we just don't do it and if we do do it it's more a programmed thing whereas every mother and every baby is unique so uh, that mother knows more about her each mother knows more about herself and her instincts her maternal instincts are, are really alive and well about herself more than anybody else does and that's always such a powerful message whenever we do speak to women within our community. It seems to be the first thing that really resonates with them is how yeah. that you've, I mean, we're already empowered as women, you've taught me that, but they really feel like they can tap in to that empowerment, yeah. that self, that self-confidence to just trust yeah. and be, be guided by their beautiful internal and, instincts. And, the, and they, they really work, don't they? We know. Yeah, one of the, yeah, one of the common... One of the common things in the system is there's a lot of coercion goes on. So then they start to engage with fear because that creates fear. The coercion takes away their maternal instincts in a way, suppresses that and takes over. So there's, you know, a whole change goes on for them to struggle through what they need mm. to do or what they choose to do or whatever they would like to do. There's no rules really except in a situation where, um, if someone is, does have a medical illness or, or there's an urgent or emergency situation. Other than that, you know, it should be the woman's journey, not everybody else's journey. And oh we should God, just It's, it's so that. true. I, I feel like yeah. anyone watching can relate to that at some point yes. along that journey, whether that's during pregnancy, during the labour and birth pro process, the, the, the following postpartum period, or even following after that. I feel like coercion is... It's, it's a very big impactful thing that happens to us as soon as yes. we become mothers, really. Yes. <laughs> Everyone wants to give their tidbit yeah. of advice, don't they? 
So, so you, talked, yeah. you talked about having a, a strong advocate, Dr. Robin, and the importance of that alongside education and preparation. Um, mm. I suppose this could be included in, in the birth plan, a way to communicate your wishes. Yeah, it can be, yes, and it's her journey, and we are very privileged to be sharing her journey with her if we are working with and beside her. But if we are dominating her, if we are coercing her, if we are not providing her the time that's required or the space and the place that's required for her, then we interfere with the whole of her unique self, her, her emotional state, her psychological state, her anatomical ability, all of those things uh, are interfered with in if we don't listen carefully, if we don't see her body language, watch her facial expression, and we just gently work with her, not under pressure. And, and that's a problem in the system. Some of the professionals who are genuinely keen to, to be with, with women is, is, is um, flouted in a way because they are under pressure to do what the system tells them to do or what the organisation tells them to do. And that systemisation is absolutely damaging normal birth, normal progress of labour. You know, the, the beautiful physiology of that woman's body is doing it. And sure, she might need help along the way, but it's how we uh, gently provide that assistance for her. Oh, my gosh, absolutely. I so wish I had known more during my pregnancy. And of course, you can go to the local antenatal classes, breastfeeding classes. But like you say, they have to follow their policies, their procedures. There's a checkbox that needs to be ticked always. Of course, they have a job to do. And when there's so many of us, when population is so high and there's so many in and out, it does it does become a, a process, as you say. And you have that experience of working in both a hospital. You, you, you did run a midwifery unit for, for several years. And of course, then you did mm. run your own private home birth practice as well. So you're talking from uh, not only an area of passion, but of really, really well-known experience too. Mm. Yeah. And, and look, it, it would be less intervention if more women were able to birth at home with a known midwife. Right, with their mm. with their chosen midwife even. That is financially viable for them. So, you know, when the governments are paying out big money for all the things that they do, we won't go into the politics. They should be also <laughs> providing <laughs> funding for women, true. Funding for women true. who are preparing and, and, and loving and giving birth to the following generations. That is perfect when we do that. So, or, or a woman stays at home with her midwife and transfers in if she chooses when she's ready or transfers in if there's a need to do so with her midwife. Mm -hmm. uh, the ideal for me would that every woman has their own chosen midwife and it's not necessarily a group of midwives. It might be a, a buddy system, but, but just so that she's secure that the, the, the midwife that she chooses and her, the midwife's buddy are available for her and so you're not looking at large numbers every month you, you're looking at what you can do as a reasonable midwife would do in the circumstances yeah and I think that what you said flows quite nicely into the point that preparation is key um, because sometimes things don't go to plan and having mm -hmm. that education that knowledge behind you like I said earlier, to be able to make informed decisions will also give you confidence in case you, you are separated from baby or in case something does happen and mm. it does interfere with those those precious three golden hours. So mm. pre preparation is key, learning about those three golden hours, discussing your wishes, uh, both uh, birth and breastfeeding with your team and your advocate. Uh, we'll pop some links down below for some really interesting reads. Dr. Robin discusses home birth in one of our blogs. She also discusses the three golden hours as well. So we're going to pop those down so you could get some more insight by the very special lady herself and the next point I wanted to get into which really does does link to uh, everything links doesn't it Dr Robin it's all a transition oh, it's, it's, it's all, all a transition yeah. you so think about it is, sorry, sorry. You think about it logically you know this little baby's growing it's transitioning towards coming into its mother's arms so that's through labor and birth and then it's on its mother's body and it's just the we most hope. Well, well we hope yes and if we have strong women we can achieve that <laughs> yes. and this beautiful baby then with the with the instinct of the mother working together is now looking to transition to the mother's breast and it's magic it's just 
like and we create so much fear for these women <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I was I was reading a story quite recently about um, how a woman in a hospital in the USA, um, she gave birth, she was encouraged to have an induction. And of course, we are very well, well aware in our community of the, the cascade of interventions, you call them. And um, eventually the baby, baby was born, everything was fine, everyone was safe. Um, but baby was taken straight away to be cleaned mm. and wrapped up. And you do speak about this in the mm. Three Golden Hours blog that I've shared. So do do head over and have a read about that because it is it's, it's way more common than we think. And of yeah. course, Dr. Robin, you do speak about strong women, but sometimes coercion happens and the fear sets in and it's it's mm. hard to make uh, the right decision for everyone. Oh, it's very hard for women in the in the um, <coughs> because they're in the moment of working hard. It's that one of the hardest things that you do in your life. And they're in that moment of doing that, and then suddenly everybody else wants to interfere. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It's and hard to say no when you're feeling vulnerable, but yeah. it's, it's also very, very important. And so that, that does include, I think, the lack of education around both birth and breastfeeding. So many of us are so geared up and prepared for our birth that we forget breastfeeding. And um, I, I suppose we could talk a little bit here about all of the education that's included in your online education mm. which includes both i mean i think there's 12 hours of um, prenatal content which is it blows my mind yourself and um, rachel austin midwife rachel austin have gone into such detail about different circumstances birth plans you shared your template in the club as well um so preparation based on experience and not policies that's what i think uh, the thompson method is would you agree <laughs> And Rachel heads up the um, the Thompson Method. Uh, I didn't call it that, you know. My professors did that. <laughs> I know, but that's a story for another day. <laughs> Rachel heads you up. You are the, just too modest. <laughs> the education. Oh, you should have seen me when they suggested it. I was really. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have loved to have been a fly on that one. Um, Rachel heads up the education uh, part of it at the practice, and she backs me. She's my buddy, and I'm her buddy, and we have. Um, Sarah and Kelly as well. They're yeah. now the Wonder um, Woman team. You four, I think. Yeah. And that this will grow in time, where there'll be more beautiful women uh, being available for other women, and you know, working through. Things. Yeah, and, and for those people... that don't know, um, Dr. Robin is referring to the Breastfeeding Academy. It's a very exciting time, <clears throat> excuse me, for us at the moment because we have launched. Dr. Robin herself has launched the academy alongside Rachel. Kelly, Sarah, and um, we hope to see many, many qualified Thompson Method um, professionals out there with you ladies in the near future. So yeah. lack of education and preparation for birth and breastfeeding. So we talk a little bit more, I think, next about the birth plan and your template. And I think that we won't go into too much detail on what to include. I'll pop a blog for that down below. Um, we've, we've spoken about this in detail before, haven't we? And yeah. Why is it important to have a birth plan and why is it important to include breastfeeding? Well, well, it gives the unique, it provides, not gives, it provides the unique woman with things to think about that might be reasonable for her. And then she might want to add to it. She might want to extract some of that information. There's, it's not a birth plan as such that I have written for individual women. It's a, a document that I've written to help women think about what they might need and then they'll add what they need themselves. Mm. And what, what comes to them instinctively, all of that information helps them, guides them and then starts to, their brain is thinking, oh, yes, you know, and maybe. And so the, the, one of the important things for me is understanding the law where you live mm -hmm. and the law of consent because so many women have things uh, done to their bodies and to them that are very questionable, but they don't need all those things. So if they understand and they and they learn about the progress of labour and, you know, they're right there with the midwife who understands all that too, then, and hopefully somewhere along the line, there'll be the graduate midwives and the student midwives beside an experienced midwife as well, so that we're passing on that knowledge as well. You know, I would love to be doing that, but I can't do everything. So that would be- <laughs> You certainly can't. 
It would be better well, than the, the rubber dolls a lot of our um, new professionals are having to use. Um, oh, the rubber dolls are, are just ridiculous. They cannot communicate. They cannot show their sensitive skills. They, and then the students don't become aware of that sensory feedback that you have when you're actually talking with and listening to and working with the unique woman. Mm -hmm. and, and seeing her body language and what she tells you all the time, the rubber dolls don't do that. They just I cannot do that. And I think I think, it's I think we're quite fortunate in some countries that um, some some policies, hospital policies, allow for vocational training to be done within the within the, the setting, within the hospital setting itself. And it, it does. I, I was quite shocked actually last year when you told me that that women were learning through rubber dolls. I, I went and researched it after we had a chat and I just could not believe that that's in some places in the world, women were becoming qualified without actually having attended a birth. It was, it, it definitely blew my mind. So I think that's a very good point. So when you yeah. say the birth plan is important, you don't just mean for the woman and the advocate, you mean for the health professionals as well. To, for the health professionals to listen to and think about how they are going to provide their service for this woman. And of course, keeping in mind, if it deviates to something that's in where she needs help or a baby needs help, then that's a different situation. But if we were to work side by side with women like we used to, there would be much less intervention, much Absolutely. less. Absolutely. Yeah. And, so and, not sorry. understanding then those three golden hours, Dr. Robin, you, you called the first breastfeed the three golden hours and you have some the key principles of the Thompson Method that, that allow this precious time to roll smoothly. Would you like to yeah. talk about just a few things? I know it, it, there are so many more than a few things, but just yeah. a few things that would help a woman achieve those three golden hours. Well, in my, in my research, one of the major problems for women having breastfeeding complications was interference with the mother and the baby to start with separating the mother and baby and then interference or interrupting the, the first breastfeed. So the three golden hours is based on the mother and baby coming together from birth and they're being united here in the big world uh, and that little baby knows its mother inside and out. It knows. And so when the baby is ready, depending on the labour and birth, depending on any drugs that were used, opiate drugs often may create sleepy babies so it can be slower than, you know, that the introduction to breastfeeding can be slower. But, you know, the, the woman that's not had these opiate drugs, their babies are generally, have, if they've got an APGAR of seven or more, are generally ready to feed. They've been feeding in the uterus, drinking the water the, the amniotic fluid and every time they drink the mother will know because the baby gets the hiccups every time it drinks so, what a strange <laughs> sensation that was the first time yeah. I that. <laughs> so so it's carrying on wanting to drink again but it takes a little bit of time for it to coordinate the small brain at the base of the skull and that coordinates all the movement for the baby to start moving towards the breast and the craniocervical spine supports the head, neck and shoulder with the nuchal ligament and the baby is actually doing the work to come to the breast with the beautiful guidance of the mother between the two of them. And then we talk about the Thompson method. Of course we do. <laughs> yeah. The very wonderful life-changing yeah. Thompson method. So, so give me important. two things that a woman or that you encourage a woman um, to avoid during those three golden hours. Is other people talking more. <laughs> other people touching, anybody taking the baby, no, and not unless that baby absolutely needs it. Not to rub the baby, not to dry the baby, just cover the baby with a warm wrap and leave the baby with the mother and just observe. You don't need to touch. If the lips are pink and the baby's moving and every now and then, you know, might turn its little head, whatever it's doing, but the mother knows. So don't interfere with that. That's the worst thing. It doesn't matter whether the woman's had a cesarean section. Don't cut the cord. Let the cord flow till it stops flowing. And that means the baby's had its full nourishment of the, of the mother's blood, the exchange in the blood, right up until it, the cord then is beginning to close down. The blood vessels are closing down. That's yeah. very important too. So. From the professional's point of view, it's time and patience. And of course, <laughs> in, in, when there's something happening, they often don't 
well they can't sometimes it just depends what the situation is but the least that we interfere with the beautiful mother and her baby the better the outcome is for the big picture all over when when this little baby's ready to feed and then the little baby feeds frequently at its leisure for about two to three hours look there's no set time it's just to give the time that's required rather than to pack this mother up and transfer her off and whip her through yeah, the system so yeah so it's all true. about and of course one of the important things that i did not know during um pregnancy or didn't know to implement during those three golden hours was to avoid those forceful techniques um of course going into this i mean this is the basis of your phd and since myself going through academy i have i mean it is mind-blowing the stuff mm -hmm. that i've learned from you um and just understanding how the baby's oral anatomy works and everything makes so much more sense it's definitely been a light bulb moment for me but without we getting have... into that because of course yeah. it would just be impossible to explain in one session why well, i can't it explain it here but it would have we have no right to touch a baby, especially yeah. by a small brain. We have no right to touch a mother without her absolute legal consent. We don't yeah. touch the body. Many of us don't, don't know that. Her. I think you feel so vulnerable. You're probably laid down somewhere. You've, you've been through what is the biggest moment of your life, as you said earlier. And mm. someone comes in and they walk. And you've said to me before they should ask, but I found in many cases and in my own case as well, I wasn't asked, it just sort of happened. <laughs> so yes. why should we avoid those forceful techniques and why should we avoid being handled? Because it is the most common reason why babies, why mothers experience little babies who create nipple trauma. That was the most common experience in my research. And then the next was um, mastitis and, and, and engorgement around the third, fourth day, breast engorgement rather than full breasts. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole general transition of the process that goes on. And, and, you know, if you understand it, it's much easier because it's all part of the milk production as well. So the maternal hormone release is, is created by the baby. It's created, it's increased once the placenta is born. You know, there's, the placenta is just the most magic, magic it's just incredible and then and then there's the contracting uterus because now it's gone it has to contract to reduce yeah. the bleeding and so i remember when we had a chat a few months ago just before christmas uh, about the power of the placenta um actually i'll pop that one down below as well that's one of my favorites um you you explained how it works the transition and the importance of that first breastfeed in the role of mm. birth of the placenta as well so we spoke about lotus birth and and lots of other really interesting things as well. And, and the baby is helping with the contraction of the uterus. So that helps stop the bleeding and, and is increasing the hormones by feeding. And that's what starts the production of the milk. The baby will transfer colostrum in the first few hours. But the next three days, the baby's building up milk volume. And that's this process the baby needs to go through with the mother. And often we interfere with that because we keep wanting to give the babies powdered milk, thick powdered milk. And if you just have to be patient, observe carefully and watch what's happening because mm -hmm. there's all this emphasis on weight loss and the weight is normally lost at from birth for about till the milk volume peaks around about day mm -hmm. three, day four. And then once the milk volume peaks, there's the pickup time. I and, agree. And I think going yeah. back to point two, <clears throat> we'll bring that up again, the lack of education. We could also bring that into there, the lack of education and understanding of how your body works to mm. produce that precious liquid gold and mm. and the transition from colostrum into breast milk i mean dr robin you explained this so beautifully in the education it's um it's a, it's really helped women to understand and have confidence and understand baby's cues in knowing that their baby is getting enough and yeah. if and when or if they're not getting enough what to do and the stages of that in the best way for their breastfeeding journey so I think that's very, very useful information. And a, ma a mother mammal and her baby, human mammal, doesn't matter what mammal, are wanting to survive. So survival means they're activating all the skills that the newborn has, all the skills that the mother has. And when they're activating that, that's that primary time of learning to survive outside the warmth and, and the comfort of the uterus. <laughs> 
Yes, they have to leave that cocoon at some point, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's let's see who's with us today. We've got some comments coming in for you, Dr. Robin. We've got Janty. I hope I've said that right. She says, hi, Rob. <laughs> is that is that Janty Blair? That's right. How do you remember all these? Oh, Janty Blair. Thanks for watching. <laughs> she really does poem. remember everyone's name, guys. It's impressive. Janty, uh, Janty is we've got a some, We've got some others. Sorry, Robin, I lost you there. Yeah, I know. Janty's a beautiful colleague of mine and has been for a long time. So, yeah, welcome, babe. <laughs> yes. Hello, hello. We love it when we have uh, yeah. Robin's colleagues and friends. Wow, around. I'm very surprised. Yeah. We have lots of people watching. We have our, our very lovely Ronelza. She said, my two favourites. <laughs> Ronelza's um, breast tandem feeding currently a three year old and a five month old. I hope I've got that oh, right. She is also a member beautiful. of our club. Well Oh, you should be very proud of yourself. She's a wonderful very lady. Proud. Yeah. So uh, we've got someone shouting out to Rachel here as well. Um, yes. we've got people tagging. If you're pregnant, let us know. Congratulations to all those pregnant ladies watching or breastfeeding women. What else is still talking? We've got some women sharing their experience. Um, just trying with trying with breastfeeding with a newborn baby. So I'll reach out to you after Lauren. Um, yeah. Uh, um, encouragement of formula in those early days as robin just mentioned and, um, and can i just mention dana has said sunshine hospital which is the the hospital that came after where i worked at footscray for many years and i was in charge of the labor i started nursing and did midwifery at there footscray. we go and now they're offering your and now that sunshine was the new building and we they transferred to there and i know it like the back of my hand yeah <laughs> I've been, i mean I've been I've been <laughs> And, they, um, and, and it does offer, oh, I'm, I'm happy that it's offering um, the Thompson method. Thank you, Dana. I didn't know that. So you've yeah, been look, many hospitals are sharing the the, key, the the basic principles of the Thompson method. But if you guys want to know more, or if you want to share more with your professionals, head over to the website. There's a link at the bottom of the screen running across now. The Thompson method dot com. Um, and of course, there's the online program as well, which has a wealth of information surrounding birth preparation breastfeeding preparation and just so much more older babies there's a professional program in the academy as well so do give me a shout if you have any questions and dana thanks you thank you for reaching out it's nice to to see robin have a smile on her face when she reminisces about her, her yeah. time well, they're, they're all my they're all my days back there when i was a cheeky <laughs> young nurse and a, you know <laughs> and a beautiful young nurse you were oh, and thank God. goodness that was and your you and always say it happens yeah, and I had beautiful people around me, like my colleagues, like um, Gillian and uh, Gillian Cordell. And there's so many beautiful people that I was into. At Jenny Belnaves, a whole lot of people. Like I can't tell you them all off by the top of my head. But, I bet know, you could people, if you had a minute. You do if have. I had time, if I had time, if I had time, I could. Yeah, <laughs> I was very, very, very blessed. Honest, very blessed. Debbie Black. Debbie Black was then in charge of the. Uh, 250 staff, I think, roughly, if I've got it right, at the of the uh, neonatal intensive care unit, the Royal Women's, and we'd worked together for years. And oh my goodness, and she did some amazing things with those little babies in the NICU. She had them out on their mothers even when they were on the CPAP machine. So. Well, the Thompson Method at its very core from your personal experiences yeah. and relationships with all these wonderful women and men that yeah. you, you met along the way in your journey. So yeah. thank you so much, everyone, for watching. We hope you found it helpful. And have we finished? Always. We, I mean, did you enjoy this one, Rob? Was it good? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's oh, hard to match up our time zones for those watching. Um, Robin usually misses dinner. I usually miss breakfast, but we do enjoy our chats, don't we? <laughs> Do, it's yeah. always fun but do share <laughs> like and share the video share it with your loved ones if they're pregnant expecting a baby spread the knowledge as far as we can get it so that women can that the thompson method can reach women far and wide across the world robin any last words thank you everybody love to all of you in these difficult times and spread our love everywhere because midwives can be really good at that and there's so many people in distress at the moment so just send the messages in the way that's best for you uh, to, to, you know, to nurture those people that are in distress. Absolutely. And love all the mothers. If you're a midwife, you just love and nurture and care for and be beside and make sure you're with them, really with them. And that will be the best 
that'll be the best that your midwife can do for you. She'll be right there with you right through every moment. And that's very precious. That's beautiful. And there you go. Robin Thompson. <laughs> Dr. Robin Thompson and her beautiful finish. Thank you so much, ladies. We hope to see you soon. Catch you next week, Wednesday. Bye, guys. Love you, Chelsea. <laughs>